Hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Pedro Monaville, and I teach African history here at NYU Abu Dhabi. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Philippe Dubuc at NYU Abu Dhabi and introduce his institute lecture entitled Histories of Imagined Urban Futures in Central Af Africa. The lecture will draw from Philippe's recent collaboration with Congolese photographer Sami Baloji. This is the first time that Philippe is visiting Abu Dhabi, but tonight is actually his second talk in NYU's global network in less than four days, as uh, he gave a presentation last Friday at uh, the African Cities Week organized by the Gallatin School at NYU New York. Philippe de Bouc is a professor of anthropology at the, University, the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. At Leuven, he also serves as the research coordinator of the Institute for Anthropological Research in Africa. He has published countless articles and several edited volumes, including in 2005, together with Alcinda Nwana, a landmark collection entitled Makers and Breakers, Children and Youth in Postcolonial Africa. Philippe is the author of two books, Kinshasa, Tales of the Invisible City, in collaboration with Belgian photographer Marie-Françoise Plissard in 2004, and Suturing the City, Living Together in Congo's Urban Worlds, in collaboration with Sami Baloji, as I mentioned already, in 2016. In 2008, the French translation of his first book was awarded the Henri Lavacherie Award from the Belgian Academy Royale des Sciences des Lettres et des Beaux-Arts. Philippe has curated several exhibitions, including an exhibition around his first book that was awarded at Golden Lion at the 9th International Architecture Biennale in Venice in 2004, and more recently, uh, an exhibition around his second book that opened in Brussels last year and that's uh, soon traveling to Toronto. In 2010, he released a documentary, a documentary film entitled Cemetery State on the life and politics of death in a major graveyard in Kinshasa. And tomorrow, <coughs> the Essential Cinema Series and the NYU African Studies Symposium are organizing a screening of the film uh, at 5.30 p.m. in the Art Center uh, in room C3B101, and you're all welcome to attend. Philippe de Bouc is a specialist in the anthropology of youth, of post-colonial Africa, and of contemporary cities. For the past three decades, his main field work has been in the, Republic, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Philippe initially worked among rural communities in southwestern Congo, over the years, moving his research to Kinshasa, the capital city, he followed the trajectories of many inhabitants from Congolese village, com village communities who have been searching for better life by migrating to the city. Without question, Philippe has produced the most influential studies on Kinshasa, a city of more than 10 million inhabitants uh, today, the second biggest in sub-Saharan Africa. As I discovered myself when I uh, began my own research there in Kinshasa 10 years ago, the city can be quite disorienting for the newcomer. Without the reading of Philip's work, I would certainly not have been able to apprehend the city in the same way. More than providing a map to navigate Kinshasa, Philip's work offers a way to reimagine its mental landscape. What his work continues to teach the growing cohort of scholars who now conduct research in the Congolese capital is how to look at the city. In 1987, when Philippe started his research in the Congo, the country was still named Zaire. Its president, Mobutu Sesseko Wazabanga, had ruled over the country for 22 years already, mostly due to corruption, a generalized economic crisis, and the early signs of the Cold War's unraveling, Mobutu's grip over power had started to seriously decline. By then, his government had long stopped investing in the country's infrastructure and population. Despite 
popular discontent and an increasing chaotic situation, Mobutu, an avid reader of Machiavelli, succeeded to maintain himself in power for more than 10 years. In Kinshasa and around the country, Congolese were left fending off for themselves and living conditions continued uh, to decline. Today, after two destructive wars, and despite the current, government, the current government's so-called revolution of modernity, Kinshasa is more than ever a place of impossibilities, where many people struggle to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. However, in contrast to scholars who see Kinshasa only as a place of lack, a dot in a global bed of slums, Philip's work invites us to make sense of the city in its own terms, to understand how infrastructure, infrastructural deficits enable specific forms of sociality and living together, to pay attention to how street children, Pentecostal churchgoers, and other denizens themselves constitute the city's infrastructure, how in the face of uncertainties, the uncertainties of everyday life, people inhabit sometimes their bodies more than they inhabit their houses. He's reminding, he's reminding us to listen to the overproduction of words in this very loud city, to what he calls the verbal infrastructure of Kinshasa, the rumors, the stories, the public performances, the imaginative acts that create the invisible city that exists in parallel to the physical city and sometimes threatens to overtake it. Among the several sites that Philip investigates in his last book, potholes might be the most emblematic. Potholes have literally conquered the city. They testify of the state's incompetency and represent a generalized erosion of the material city. However, this acknowledgement is only a starting point for Philip. In his own words, what scholars should do is investigate how ordinary people in Kinshasa read meaning into the black hole of the city. So without further ado, I'll leave Philip guide us through Kinshasa, Ceterotopies, and imagined urban futures. Thank you uh, very much. Can, can you hear me in the back? Yes. Thank you, Pedro, first of all, for uh, inviting me here. It was indeed a kind of whirlwind tour from New York, uh, New York City to Abu Dhabi in, uh, in a couple of days. But uh, so it's, it's nice to be here and to discover uh, uh, Abu Dhabi and why you Abu Dhabi. And uh, so I hope my talk will also resonate with the place that we're in uh, somehow. Um, so, and if you uh, allow me and cut me short when I'm, when I'm going over time, I'm a bit of a diesel motor, I'm slow to start, but then once I get going, I don't know how to stop anymore very often. So, um, uh, I would like to, to present a little bit of, of the recent work that I did together with uh, Sami Baloji, uh, who's by now, uh, I think, internationally well-known uh, photographer. We made this book together uh, during a number of, between 2013 and 2016. We spent many months together in various uh, urban contexts in, in Congo. It also resulted in uh, an exhibition that is at the moment still uh, on display in, in the Open Society Foundation in New York, but will move to Toronto uh, soon. And so uh, before going into some of the, the major themes around which the book uh, Suturing the City was built, I would like to say a brief word about why this collaboration or why does an anthropologist, an ethnographer, an urban anthropologist like myself and a photographer, why do do we need that kind of collaboration, in my view? Uh, let me quickly move to, I'm going to skip some, some parts here. Uh, so in, um, I can say in the, in the, the, the book that uh, 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 Pedro mentioned, uh, my first book already uh, a long time ago, 2004, was a collaboration, the first collaboration with a, with a photographer. Marie-Françoise Plissard, a Belgian photographer. And basically the aim of that book, uh, or the proposition, and, uh, uh, was what makes a city into a city. Uh, if we take a city like Kinshasa, as Pedro mentioned, more than 10 million inhabitants today, so it's a huge urban uh, conglomeration. Uh, and yet there is hardly the, any 
uh, urban architecture as we would define it, or kind of zero degree architecture, there's hardly any infra urban infrastructure that works in the way that uh, we expect it to work. And yet it is a city, so what makes a city into a city? So it was a, actually a kind of vertical exercise to dive into the city as a, 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 a state of mind in a way, a kind of mental space. So, and I tried to, to uncover uh, the, yeah, the, the, the affective landscapes, the moods, the, 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 the words, the stories, the, the, uh, the whole relationship between the day and the night, the occult. I think photography also lends itself uh, to that very well. It was Walter Benjamin who spoke about uh, a kind of optical unconscious uh, in, in photography. That's why so many photographs about cities take the work of Brassa in, in, uh, for Paris and others. Very often these photographs are taken at night. And so there's something that, that allows that you can do with photography to, to delve into that kind of vertical space and to see the city as a, as a kind of mental uh, a, a, a state of mind in a way. The Suturing the City book, the, the, the current work with Sami, uh, I can say, uh, starts or proceeds from the opposite direction. Rather than being a, a vertical exercise, it is a much more, it has become a much more horizontal book, you can say. It's, it's a book about the surface, about the, the, the plane of the city, uh, not beyond, but in the various material appearances of the city, its current infrastructures, its, its architectures in the various forms of dilapidation uh, uh, or emergence in which they find themselves. And on, on that first level, it's a book about how such spaces, uh, often imperfect, often unfinished, or often in need of repair, how such spaces animate life in the city and are animated by it, uh, so to speak. That does not mean that we don't have an eye for the vertical or for the temporal layerings, the, the, the various historical palimpses that made the, the city surface into what it is today. Uh, quite on the contrary, I think uh, the, the whole book is also uh, very much a kind of exercise into trying to read these, these palimpsests together and, and uh, see how the, the, the present emerges out of these various pasts. I think Sammy's work in particular He's always been a photographer uh, who has been very attentive to these, these, historic, these histories, these temporal layers in all of his photographic and artistic uh, work. His art is basically about how various times convert into the space of the, the now, you can say. Uh, and uh, so he became rightly famous for his photo collages uh, um, uh, in which this presence of various pasts is rendered uh, uh, very often, as in this series here, uh, photos uh, of, of himself, of a kind of post-industrial uh, landscapes of his home uh, province, Katanga, which was in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, a very industrialized copper mining industry that by now has fallen into disrepair. So he photographs this, this, this uh, yeah. The, the, these leftovers of these industrial pasts. And on top of that, he puts archival photos that come from the archives of the, the, the mining uh, 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 industries uh, in, in Katanga, photos from the, the 1920s, 1930s. So, so he, he really tries to unravel the, the palimpsest uh, of the city through a photographic uh, work that, that centers around themes such as memory, nostalgia, uh, history uh, and so on. And in this sense, I see his work as, as a, a, a collecting and recollecting of urban paths in the present and the, the possible futures that one uh, can inhabit from that point on. So, but what is it then uh, about a city such as Kinshasa that renders it uh, or that makes it available for this kind of uh, investigation? In terms of common sense, the city is, of course, uh, talked about as a place of inhabitation, of cohabitation, where people have to live together uh, uh, or attempt to, to chart out a life for themselves and with each other. And, uh, and therefore, the city is always something that needs to be stabilized in a way. Uh, uh, it needs to be read and experienced in predictable ways. 
And yet it's precisely that that doesn't work. Uh, 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 there seems to be something about the city that greatly refuses inhabitation, that resists uh, to be fixed and to be predictable. Uh, and sometimes it's as if the city itself becomes a huge black hole uh, that makes any clear assessment of itself uh, uh, simply disappear in the, 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 the force of its own gravity, in, in the, uh, a black hole that is more corrosive you can say, than the images and life forms that it uh, hides. And um, so our horizontal exploration of uh, the cityscape has basically turned out to, it's, it has become in a way an exploration of, into, of, of the qualities of that black hole, of the hole. Um, in a way, Sammy's own work, he's always been a photographer of post-colonial holes uh, here. Uh, for example, like in this photograph, uh, artisanal mining sites in, in Catania. In my own work, I've always had a, a, an interest, a, a deep interest in all kinds of holes. Uh, uh, my earlier work uh, centered around uh, artisanal diamond uh, mining, for example, on the border with Congo and Angola. I've made a movie about the holes in, 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 in graveyards, uh, uh, and, and so on. And uh, in, this, in this current book, uh, we very much also look into the qualities of the pothole. Right? And uh, so you can say that the hole, in a way, is, is a kind of, uh, I, I see it as a kind of generic infrastructure of what the city is. In fact, there are two infrastructures that are important. Um, and in the remainder of the presentation, we'll talk about the, the both. There is the hole on one side, I'll come to that. But there's also its opposite, the opposite topos in a way, the mountain. Um, and uh, it, the mountain also determines in, 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 to a great extent uh, what the city of Kinshasa has become uh, by now. And um, so you can read uh, a lot of the, the, the historical layers that made the city into what it is today from the starting point of the mountain. Here we have a, a, an aerial photograph of uh, Kinshasa, so the, the big black snake that you see uh, uh, running through the photograph is of course the Congo River at the, uh, the oh, sorry, the, uh, here that gray spot that by now has, has really covered, uh, extended towards the east and the southwest, that's Kinshasa. Here you see the national airport and so on. On the other side, a tiny baby uh, that is Brazzaville, the other capital of the other Congo, uh, Congo Brazzaville. And uh, where the two uh, meet, the Congo River becomes a huge inner sea that was formerly known as Stanley Pool, that is now uh, called Malebo, the Pool Malebo. And it's at this spot, at this corner here, that the city was actually founded by. Uh, Stanley, and the first trading post uh, in the uh, late 19th, uh, 1870s, early 1880s, was built on top of uh, this hill here that uh, in pre-colonial times uh, was inhabited by the autochthonous populations that were there before the, the colonizers arrived, Humbu and Teke uh, 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 villages and uh, villagers. And this mountain was called Konzo Ikulu, and it was an important space, an important spot uh, where ancestral worship took place, where uh, ancestors were buried, where uh, 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 villages of, of, of important political chiefs who oversaw the, the trade in the Malebo pool uh, would be uh, constructed. And that's exactly the spot where Stanley planted his flag. Konzo Ikulu became uh, Leopold Hill after Leopold II, the Belgian uh, king who, uh, for whom Stanley worked. And, uh, and so you can see how uh, by going through the history of that mountain, you can connect pre-colonial, colonial histories, but also post-colonial ones uh, in 1960 at independence, uh, Mobutu immediately reclaimed that hill. Uh, it was renamed Mont Galiema, Galie de, uh, Galiema Hill, uh, after the name of the, uh, the pre-colonial uh, local Teke chief that used to control that part of the, the Congo River. So the, the, the pre-colonial history was reinstated by Mobutu. A presidential pa palace was built on top of that hill. And, uh, and so you see how that hill itself uh, uh, becomes a powerful metaphor for conveying and giving for 
two specific ways in which all of these different colonizing uh, colonizers, in a way, pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial post ones, uh, how they themselves understood governance and sovereignty and domination and control and, and, and coercion also. Uh, another mountain uh, is the one that you see at the very top of the, the photograph, uh, the eastern gateway to Kinshasa. It's called Mangengenge. And that too was, in pre-colonial times, a very important uh, ritual, political uh, spot uh, in, in, and, uh, and it has remained a very important place in the spiritual geography, let's say, of the city. Uh, in colonial times, it was colonized by the Catholic missionaries who, who uh, turned it into a place of pilgrimage. There's a station of the cross that you can uh, walk up to, up to the very top. In recent years, that Catholic place has been overtaken by Pentecostals. And there's a Pentecostal prayer camp now, and people retreat from the city and purify themselves of, of the, 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 all the urban sins in a way by praying sometimes for days or weeks on top of that mountain. So it's one of these places, again, that tells you something about the emergence of the city and, uh, and uh, where it comes from. Um, so the mountain, I think, not only uh, symbolized uh, the panoptical and, and authoritarian ambitions of the colonial state, uh, but its vertical dimension also formed the perfect illustration of uh, the, the ambitious dreams of colonialist modernity, and especially after the Second World War, uh, after 1945, um, the emerging physical landscape of the, the colonial city, uh, Kinshasa was still then Leopoldville, uh, uh, that, that, that physical landscape in its verticality uh, symbolized these dreams to the full. In the period following upon World War II, uh, the sky was indeed the limit for Leopoldville, and the colonial image of the mountain was reinforced and transformed into, or translated into a vertical, the vertical propositions of tropical modernist uh, architecture. As Tim Ingold notes in one of uh, his, his recent publications, in the contemporary world, the skyscraper model has come to dominate the way in which mountains, particularly of a more iconic or spectacular kind, have come to figure in the popular imagination. And that's really true for uh, the, the post-World War II uh, Leopoldville. So th that colonial mountain, Stanley Hill, became in a way a skyscraper. The very first skyscraper that was built in Central Africa is this one. It's uh, still standing there in the heart of the, the old colonial city, uh, 10 stories high. It's called the Forestcom Tower. It was built in 1946. And it was a, a, a tremendous uh, source of colonialist pride. And the, the colonizers were very proud of this building. It, it symbolized the fact that uh, Leopoldville, Belgian colonialism, uh, that, that, that uh, had, had, had fully mastered that place, that uh, Leopoldville had become a European city in a way. Even for the colonizer, the, the, they were very proud of this building. And it proved that, uh, as it was called, uh, Leopoldville had become Potomwindu, the, the black Europe. Living in Leopoldville was like living in Europe. So, uh, But again, you see how these, these, uh, these, these uh, skyscrapers and colonialism uh, vertical topographies were then uh, Reinscribed in, in, uh, by the post-colonial uh, uh, Mobutist uh, state project, right next to this building, uh, Mobutu in the 1970s constructed this one, the Sosakum Tower, higher and more imposing, even outdoing that uh, the success of colonialism, wiping it out by this new skyscraper, and. Um, and so you see how both the mountain and the skyscraper in their verticality, in a way, uh, have, have remained uh, important images. Uh, um, of course, there is a, a, a huge gap between these former dreams uh, and, and uh, the actual living conditions in uh, the city of Kinshasa. Uh, Congo's urban dwellers have long since, uh, uh, have long since abandoned to think of their cities uh, uh, as glorious mountains or as, as glorious skyscrapers. The only mountains that appear on the horizon of their uh, 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 urban worlds are those that consist of the, the garbage that is no longer collected by the urban authorities. Uh, but um, 
even though the, uh, the, the, uh, the skyscraper model itself continues to be used all the time uh, to project images of the new, uh, the, the new uh, Kinshasa, uh, the new city uh, yet to come. Uh, for example, this image, it's not Lub uh, Kinshasa, it's Lubumbashi. It's uh, the, the model of a skyscraper that the city projects to build. It's not there yet, it just it exists as a kind of uh, image, uh, kind of uh, spectacular and specular image. It's called, uh, the, the building is called hypnose, hypnosis, so it tells you something about the hypnotic qualities of the, of the aesthetics, aesthetics that come from here, you know, from Dubai and, and Doha and Abu Dhabi, uh, that are grafted upon a, a, a kind of segregatory uh, uh, and, and exclusionist geography that the former colonial city consisted of. The, the, the colonial city itself was very segregated by nature between the white colonial heart the, the expat city and a periphery of the, the indigenous cité, as it was called. There was a huge difference between La Ville, the city, and the cité, the white and the black city. Uh, a, a real color bar that was, uh, in, in terms of urban planning, installed in all of these uh, Central African cities. And that kind of segregation continues to exist, for example, very clearly so in this project, again, uh, a project that mainly exists in terms of, of uh, uh, yeah, visual uh, aesthetics, uh, uh, La Cité du Fleuve. It's, it, it's run by a German Indian or Indian German who used to work in Dubai, uh, by the way. Two artificial islands that are being created in the Congo River and on which the, the new city of Kinshasa will uh, emerge. So again, the whole proposition sold itself by means of this, I mean, the verticality of the skyscraper in a way. In reality, uh, one of the first islands, the first half of the first island is being built, but what is built on it is a kind of very bland and banal suburban infrastructure in which a skyscraper does not appear at all, but it's a skyscraper that makes it work. Um, and then there is, of course, the reappropriation of the skyscraper model uh, in local terms. For example, this building, which uh, also became a video installation that Sami Baloji and myself made. Um, and unfortunately, we won't have the time to watch it. But uh, it's a building that emerged uh, uh, from 2003 up to today. It's, it's, it will never be finished, but uh, a, a doctor, a guy who built this thing 12 stories high, two stories higher than the, the, the former colonial skyscraper. Uh, and uh, and uh, we made him do this doctor who, who says of himself, I don't know whether he's a real doctor or not, I think he is, but uh, he calls himself a doctor of aeronautic and spatial medicine, uh, whatever that might mean in the, Cologne, in, in the, the Congolese context. But so a, a guy clearly obsessed by the vertical, by the, the transcendent, by the skies. And, uh, and so he built his, he built his, this, this, uh, his dream in, into reality. And so in, it's a very programmatic building. It's empty, and so he lives there all by himself with his wife, and by now an eight-month-old kid, Oscar, called the, the, the king of the tower. Uh, and uh, so the three of them live there in this otherwise empty building, but in which he envisages to, to open an aviation school for pilots. Uh, 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 there's a hospital there uh, uh, where the, the physical body is treated, but on top of it, there's also a kind of spiritual healing place. You're close to God, close to, to heaven. Uh, you can pray. So there's a connection between body and soul that is made in that building. So it's very programmatic. It's a city within a city. It's one of these, these places where you, 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 you find, in a way, Kinshasa with all of its uh, potential and all of its frictions uh, uh, embodied in that one building. That, and so it's become a very powerful uh, video installation, in a way. Uh, but there is, of course, also uh, the attraction of the tower that existed even in pre-colonial times. I stumbled upon a passage in a book that most of us um, uh, probably have never read or, either, or have forgotten, a book by the Belgian anthropologist Luc de Heuge, uh, The Drunken King, uh, used to be a classic uh, in its day, uh, in which he, uh, he uh, um, um, uh, mentions a number of Luba myths, the Luba of uh, central Congo, the Kasai area, uh, pre-colonial myths in which the tower pro uh, figures prominently. Uh, and that tower is, of course, these myths originated in the 19th century. Uh, so the tower is Babel. So it's a kind of biblical uh, uh, image, uh, iconic figure that is, uh, that is taken and be became part of this local autochthonous myth. So the, the, the notion of the tower has always been there. 
And yet today, many of the dreams that the city engendered have become disappointments. And um, even though the image of the skyscraper, as I just said, is recycled by the government to promote visions of uh, a new uh, city of the future, the raw urgencies of uh, living in the physical and social environments of Congo's uh, uh, capital constantly belie, of course, these vertical dreams and, and, and images. There exists a, a, a huge gap, a, a hiatus uh, between official urban planning projects and, uh, uh, and people's everyday lives in the shadow of uh, colonial and post-colonial uh, towers. Instead, uh, in their attempt to uh, uh, make sense of the life that the, the city imposes upon them, urban uh, denizens have turned to the opposite topographical figure, namely that of the, the sinking ground or that of the hole. In Kinshasa, I think, as well as in many other uh, urban contexts in Congo and in Central Africa, the concept of the hole, uh, or Libulu, as it is uh, called in Lingala, the, the city's uh, lingua uh, franca, um, the, the, the concept of the hole has come to define the wretched and dreary place that um, the city has turned into for many of its uh, inhabitants. Uh, there is this uh, 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 text by uh, Sonny Laboutancy. Uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with his work. If you aren't, uh, you, you've got to read his novels or his theatrical texts. He's a fantastic, uh, fantastic writer who died far too young in 1995. But in one of his earliest and um, never really finished texts, and it was the, the, that was never played, uh, a theater text, and was published only posthumously after his death, the play is entitled Le Trou, The Hole. And in it, he starts that uh, uh, theatre text by saying, um, there is the hole. So as not to fall in it, one has to enter it. The hole of life, the hole of the others, the hole of the world, the hole of hopes, the hole of reality, and the hole of dreams. The hole of religions, and the hole that your own flesh is making inside you. He died of AIDS himself. But, and he continues, and then there is the hole that we call tomorrow. Even, even time has become a hole. Uh, tomorrow is set up as if it were uh, an explosive device, as if it were a bomb. And uh, today traces tomorrow in the sand with its foot. And so even in, in temporal times, and I think it's very important to think about temporality and time and rhythm in order to capture uh, what the city is in a way, uh, but so even to straddle the divide between today and tomorrow, to plan ahead for 24 hours, even that turns out to be sometimes very hard. It's like falling into a hole, uh, an abyss that opens up and uh, that you didn't see come. Um, and so as in the literary universe of, of Sonny Laboutancy, where the hole is used as a, a, a trope really to philosophize upon uh, uh, about the human condition in Kinshasa and by extension in Congo, the whole is really has really become a kind of local master trope, uh, a conceptual figure that expresses the, the dismal quality of urban life in the, the post-colonial city. In the minds of many, uh, the city has indeed literally become a kind of uh, hollowed land. Uh, and uh, and post-colonial urban living very often literally means living with potholes uh, as generic urban infrastructure. It also uh, means very often living with very real danger of uh, soil erosion after heavy rainfalls. Uh, these, these create giant holes and, and ravines in, uh, that swallow houses and people and roads. As you can see, it's not a photo by Sami, but from a, a, a Congolese newspaper. And uh, the largest erosion sites, such as this one, have even been given individual names as if they were real persons uh, uh, with their own character, their own temperament. This one is known as uh, Libulu Manzengele, Kuzengele, is, is to, to cut, to, to, to interrupt. And uh, this particular erosion site uh, became so well known that it also gave its name to a, a very famous nightclub in uh, Bobigny in Paris, a uh, Congolese nightclub. Um, so the concept of the whole uh, and, and erosion, erosion sites are everywhere. This is a photograph taken three weeks ago. Uh, it's basically the, uh, the main road from the lower Congo into Kinshasa that was cut in two by, uh, after a, a heavy rainfall. 
so these erosion sites uh, occur at, in at least 400 different points throughout the city uh, at this moment. Uh, uh, but um, the concept of the whole, uh, yeah, this is another recent photo after uh, 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 last month there was, uh, most of Kinshasa was flooded by heavy rains and uh, after the water retreated, that's what the streets uh, looked like. Um, so the concept of the whole that urban residents refer to in order to express the quality of their lives in the setting of the city uh, not only references these physical, tangible uh, uh, depressions in, in the city's surface, uh, but uh, the whole also refers to the black hole of urban living in itself, the, the, the dark matter of the urban praxis uh, itself. Nibulu may refer to uh, the darkness of being imprisoned, uh, being imprisoned by the city. It also refers to actual imprisonment. Nibulu uh, refers to the prison uh, as a physical site, but it refers to uh, the graves uh, that you find in many marked and unmarked graveyards uh, throughout the city. So it, it, it refers, the, the whole refers to the city as a kind of death world in and of itself. And the film that I made about that uh, a, a graveyard that will be screened tomorrow clearly uh, shows that, I think. Uh, but Libulu also refers to the meager livelihoods that artisanal mining halls, uh, for example, offer or uh, informal markets. Uh, um, uh, Libulu refers to the, the city's uh, shadow, second uh, shadow informal economy uh, that you see in many, many places throughout the city. And, um, and uh, so the concept of the whole, in a way, then, is often used uh, to, to, to reference all of that, to reference the quality of city life, but also to make ironic comments upon uh, the state of things in, in the city. Uh, a couple of years ago, for example, a businessman opened up uh, 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 a, a well-known nightclub uh, called uh, Le Grand Liboulou, the big hole. It's actually constructed next to the Forest Comte Tower, the, uh, the, the colonial skyscraper. Just at the foot of the skyscraper, there is Le Grand Liboulou, this nightclub that is built literally on top of an erosion site. So the dance floor, you dance on top of a hole in a way. And um, the formula became so successful that the same owner opened up another bar with the same name in a different uh, place in, in town. And by now, the name in itself has become a generic name to reference a bar, a cafe, a pub, uh, a, a, a place. A typical quinoa answer to the, 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 um, the, re the, the subject of holes, in a way. If we have to live in a hole, we can as well dance in it. Uh, it's a typical kind of Kinshasa humor. Uh, but so the notion of the whole is thus used as a kind of metaphor to describe all of the, the shady deals that urban dwellers constantly have to make in order to survive in the informal economy. All of the impromptu movements that uh, uh, into often uncharted uh, spatial but also social and mental territory that the city forces them uh, to make. Um, in the work of Joshua Walker, who, is a, uh, who now holds a postdoctoral position in, in, at WITS, uh, who is a, a Komarov student, and he worked in another uh, city hall, let's say, uh, the, the mining town of Mbujimai in central Congo, uh, a mining town where, uh, uh, that, that mines for, on an industrial scale for diamonds. And uh, he says in his work, the concept of hall um, uh, uh, or holes are both symptom and metaphor for an experience of loss that is simultaneously material, as we just said, but also moral. Uh, erosion itself signifies not only the city's physical decline, it also informs discourses about the corrosion of wealth uh, and values. But even if holes uh, have emerged as Kinshasa's um, generic type of, of infrastructure, as well as a kind of meta-concept, uh, to reflect upon the degradation of, of infrastructure and upon the closure uh, uh, of, of social life that, that follows the, the, the colonial city's physical uh, ruination. There still is the question as to how the gap between colonial mountain or tower and post-colonial hole is, is overcome, how that, how that hole is filled in a way uh, in the experience of the urban resident. Apart from dancing, what kind of possible answer can uh, uh, 
people come up with in response to the challenge presented by these uh, holes. If the city is transformed into uh, towers, into holes, how can holes become illuminated? How, how can you turn the blackness of the hole into something else uh, so that they become mountains or, or vertical propositions again, uh, in a way? I think it's important to, to remind us, uh, ourselves that discourses of holes, um, as, as Joshua Walker also says, uh, a hole implies removal, implies empty, the production of empty space, uh, but that perhaps that discourse in itself is deeply problematic uh, in that it suggests that urban existence uh, is only defined by lack, by depletion, um, as if the process of ex extraction uh, uh, were, uh, uh, were not uh, in and of itself productive in any sense uh, besides the depletive. And I think that's true. I, the, 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 the hole is never just simply uh, a, a black hole. It's never merely hollow or, or, or emptied of content. Uh, holes also have the capacity, in a way, to uh, metaphorically elide uh, how life continues through and despite of very often uh, uh, decline. And, and even if living the experience of the whole on a daily uh, basis considerably complicates life, uh, it considerably often I mean, cuts you off of a, a number of possibilities, uh, it often degrades the quality of, of urban living, the whole in itself also might offer, for at least for those who know how to read it, uh, offer uh, uh, an opening, uh, an aperture, uh, uh, a possibility uh, in a way. And um, to give just one example, actually Sammy and I proceeded by, I call it urban acupuncture, so we, we selected s specific sites. Uh, it's impossible eh, on, a, on a kind of uh, a methodological level to write an ethnography of a city as a whole. So uh, y you have to make choices, and these choices are, of course, individual and subjective ones. But so I, I, I selected the number of sites that I thought, like the, the tower, made by the doctor, a kind of city within a city, uh, or a specific colonial building, such as this one, or a, a, a graveyard, or a field, or a, a pothole in the street, where something happens, where uh, uh, publics uh, are, are being constituted, uh, where, where uh, 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 the thickenings and quickenings of people and, and, and consumer goods and so on take place. So meaningful sites that you can then and you could put your, your analytical needle into it, your, your, uh, your acupunctural needle, and try to write out or to photograph a, a, a kind of uh, yeah, uh, an ethnographic understanding of that place, and then see how all of these places connect, how the nerve centers radiate outwards and connect to other places, uh, as, as, as with a body uh, that is being acupunctured uh, in a therapeutic way, in a way. So one of the places that I selected is this building. It's a, a, fan, a fantastically beautiful modernist kind of L-shaped building that was uh, constructed in the mid-1950s outside of the, the colonial city as it then existed. And it was a place that was used as a, a relay station for outgoing uh, telephone and telegraph uh, communication. So it basically connected uh, uh, the, 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 the colonial city to the metropole, to Europe, to the outside world. Um, Later on, uh, in the, the 1970s, uh, uh, a radio and television station of the National Television Company was added uh, uh, in that building. And then the building itself uh, was looted several times in the early 1990s. The, the, the slums uh, uh, rose up all around it and engulfed that building. It was slowly eaten up, in a way, by the city. Today, it still belongs to the Ministry of Telecommunications. But, uh, and so the people who uh, inhabit and use that building, uh, many of them are still officially civil servants of the ministry, even though they've not been paid for, last time I asked, 155 months, I think, so for many, many years of non-payment. And in return, the, the ministry itself said, well, well, we're not capable of paying your salary, but we offer you free living in this building. You can officially squat this building, and so it's inhabited by uh, three to four hundred people now, uh, civil servants or the children of former civil servants who might in the meantime have died or their parents and so on. So a real village that is being constructed, huts uh, being uh, built in, in, inside what was formerly the machine rooms of the, uh, of the, uh, the colonial relay station. 
And uh, so again, it's a kind of uh, a, a place, a city within a city. By now, there's a restaurant, there's a communal radio station, there's a church in it, there's a police station, uh, all kinds of activities, all kinds of people assembled there. And, um, and uh, for years, I, I used to live uh, uh, just behind this building. And um, one thing that always struck me was that the road uh, leading uh, uh, past this building was always uh, muddy and there was always water in the potholes. And this is in the dry season so it's still kind of possible but as soon as it rains the whole thing is flooded and, um, and but even in the dry season it remains like this. So basically uh, in order to reach my friend's house where I stayed I had to leave my car in front of that building, in front of the police office you pay something to the uh, police officers, uh, they watch over your car and you continue on foot and for the years I was thinking, but why, first of all, does that mud remain there? And the, the, the reason why is because underneath here is a, a broken drainage pipe, so all of the water from the building drips down onto the street and creates this, uh, this mud. And I thought, how much can it cost to repair that pipe? Uh, if all of the inhabitants of that building put one dollar together uh, each, uh, you, 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 you can repair it, until it finally dawned upon me that all of these people were busy not trying to repair the pipe and to, to, to repair the, the road in a way, but to keep the road in that state. Because that mud, uh, of course, does various things. You see here underneath the building, it's still very early in the morning. Uh, there's not a lot of activity going on, but there are women, and some of them might be the, the wives of the civil servants who officially can live in the building, others the girlfriends of the police officers that work there, and so on. They manage to grab and to, 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 uh, uh, to, to get hold of a square meter to put their little tables and their little stalls. And so it actually, for them, it's very important that that mud remains in place because the, the people who walk past are pushed to the side. And so in a way, the pothole there creates customers. Uh, without the mud, they wouldn't pass underneath the building and nobody would buy from these women. It wouldn't be a viable spot, so to speak. And I think, so, there, if you, the, the, so their main concern is how to keep the pothole alive and how to become, in a way, the, 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 the owner, the proprietor of a, of a viable pothole, of a, a profitable pothole. And for those of us who work in African urban context, we all know, uh, in the, the, the roads that you pass in your car, there's a pothole, there's always a guy with a shovel filling it up and then asking for some money uh, because it makes your mobility possible. And of course, that very same person uh, in the evening at night empties that pothole again so that it can restart the next morning. And so the thing is, how do I become the, the owner of a pothole that is profitable? I know personally a number of people who've been working around the same pothole for the past 15 years and, uh, and that pothole is their livelihood so every, every day they fill it, every night they empty it and without that pothole they wouldn't receive any money. So the pothole there becomes not a kind of uh, yeah, uh, an infrastructure that, that, um, of, of lack, of, the, of, 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 of something that doesn't work. No, it becomes a possibility. It becomes, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a negative infrastructure. It's, it's a negative of, of, of something. Uh, so I, I, I compare it to reverse graffiti, uh, where rather than spraying paint on a wall in order to make an image emerge, you wash off the dirt of a wall and the image comes out of the dirt in a way. And so the pothole as infrastructure, as an infrastructure unit works like that. Uh, it becomes a possibility. And that's how basically I've tried to look at holes uh, in that sense uh, as also, uh, you can say, suturing points, uh, points of uh, suture. Um, if the hole is the city's baseline, um, uh, it, if it's, it, it's it round zero, you can say, uh, and in that sense, the hole becomes a suture. There is, uh, and some of you might be familiar with her work, uh, Pedro, of course, and she was uh, his supervisor, Nancy Rosant, in a, a recent publication, Suturing New Medical Histories of Africa, uh, uh, uses that notion of uh, suturing uh, to join together in new ways, as she calls it, different colonial medical histories in Congo, and she argues sutures suggest, uh, suturing suggests uh, closing a wound, making an incision, uh, 
stitching together parts, locations, points of view, and as such, it, point, it also points to uh, new kinds of creativity with sources, with evidence, with interactivity. And, uh, and so in that work, uh, in, in, in the book, in Suturing the City, uh, Sammy and I, I picked up on that idea in a way and extended that notion of suture as closure, as junction, as seam, uh, to the ways in which, often against all odds, the, 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 the city's inhabitants um, uh, use material, mental, uh, moral holes uh, as suture points to fill the gap to overcome the hiatus and, uh, and, and to, to really to, to design realignments of the world in a way, to, 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 uh, to redefine the zero, the impossibility the impossible circumstances of living in the kind of urban environment uh, that Congo cities offer, uh, to revert that, to read that into a possibility, something else, a surplus. And in that sense, the notion of suture also remains very closely, very close to its original meaning. You, we know, of course, it's, uh, suturing is a, a psychoanalytical concept, uh, not invented, uh, by the way, by Lacan, but by one of his co-disciples, uh, Jacques-Alain Miller, who in a, a, a famous text on suturing uh, 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 writes uh, that, uh, for, that for him the, the suture is always between the, 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 the number zero, uh, zero as lack, as, as something impossible to conceptualize, something that is not there. But zero uh, is also a figure, it's a number, it's, and therefore it's also a one, it, it is something. Uh, and uh, it's in that sense that the whole as suture both presents uh, uh, represents lack, while also, uh, in a way, placing and uh, suturing it. Um, and, uh, and so, what I've tried to capture and to understand in, 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 our, in our work here uh, is how urban residents do exactly that. Uh, how, how, in this zero world of the city, they manage, with varying degrees of uh, uh, success, to turn the zero into a one, how they read potential and, and, and promise and prospect into the blackness uh, of the whole, how they throw their, I mean, their bodies, their words uh, into this daily struggle, and how it's the whole itself in a way that propels them to do that. And um, in that sense, the, the, the trope of the whole and the suture tell us something about the, the changes, I think, that have taken place in how urbanity is imagined and lived in, in, in Congo, where, as this picture says, uh, l'impossible n'est pas congolais. The impossible is not Congolese. So that means that in every impossibility, yeah, it, it's not Congolese, so in every impossibility there is a possibility opening up in a way. Eh? And, uh, and so uh, I think I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, there's a lot I could say about that, but uh, uh, by way of a, a kind of uh, conclusion. So the, the question then, and I use Latour, but well, we actually don't need Bruno Latour to think about that, but, uh, but uh, the, the question that he asks himself, what sort of collective life and what sort of knowledge is to be gathered once modernity has been thrown into doubt, uh, while the task of finding ways to inhabit remain more important than ever? And I think that's a question that 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 city is throwing at us. So, uh, uh, if the notion of the whole offers a kind of meta concept uh, that people use to reflect upon the material degra degradation of the city's infrastructure, but also uh, a notion uh, in order to rework the closures of life in the city, the, the question then becomes: How is this reworking taking place? Uh, how this reassembling? of the whole into something else uh, takes place. And uh, if the city is transformed into a zero world uh, or a black hole, then uh, how, can, uh, how can it become animated space again uh, that enables living and living together? And now about the notion of living together, of course, you can say a lot too. Uh, what does that mean, actually? And how do you achieve living together? How do, how do you make a public space and a public sphere? And how do publics emerge in the city and so on? But maybe we can pick that up uh, in the, the, the time that is left for us for discussion. So thanks a lot. <laughs>